All right, here we go. Got the screen switched over. So I'm doing this one as a live stream. I'm sorry about the mess, but this is my office slash the room that all the stuff gets thrown into because um, we're doing a lot around the house. Anyways, I'm going to do these as live streams, I think every time from now on, and I'm not really expecting anybody to show up or not show up. Hopefully I'll start announcing them early in the future so you all can show up if you want. Uh, but I just feel more comfortable interacting than I do just sort of planning something out and then just staring at a camera and talking. Uh, all I'll ask is that if you're commenting, asking questions and whatnot, so that I can engage with you. Let's keep it on the topic. Uh, and then I'll do other live streams like Q and A's where it's just sort of ask me anything. So the topic today is how to vet property managers and how they're vetting you. Uh, it's really important. It's come up a lot lately because a lot of people are watching this channel who didn't previously work with property managers a whole lot. And what's happening is I'm telling people go work with property managers and property management companies for all of these reasons while well, they're going and they're finding property managers. And then they're messaging me, emailing me and commenting that they found a property manager and the whole thing went to shit and they owe them a bunch of money and they don't like working for them. And they did all kinds of bad things. And my answer to that is uh, essentially that when you have a property manager, you vet them once. I mean, it may take months before you can really consider them to have been vetted, but you vet them once. And once you vetted them, they're vetted. You know that they're good. You know that you have a good working relationship as opposed to homeowners, where if you're if you're dealing with 500 different homeowners per year, now you need to vet 500 homeowners or you need to deal with all the issues that are going to arise because you didn't vet them. So we're going to start off with, uh, I've made a list. I've got five basic areas with some breakdowns of each area, but these are how you vet property managers. And essentially what I'm showing you is, is the red flags that you need to watch out for. So, and again, feel free to comment, ask questions and stuff. If anybody's in here, I don't, yeah, I don't even think there's anybody in here and we are live. Oh no, there's a couple people in here. Okay. So number one, is they're cheap. That's a bad thing that takes time out of your day. It just it creates a bunch of hassle that you don't need because you need to be focused on the business. So uh, also let me know that I have good audio. The two people who are in here so far, if y'all are hearing me and you can hear my audio all right, let me know. I'm always having audio problems. I got a brand new microphone like six months ago and it's not working now for some reason. So number one, you don't want them to be cheap. And what do I mean by cheap? I've got a few examples here. One is they're always questioning your prices. Uh, and when I say always, I mean frequently, and you do have to keep in mind, and this is gonna apply to everything that I'm gonna go over here. These are red flags assuming you're a good handyman. Now, they might be red flags that let you know you're not a good handyman. So you need to know the difference. But number one is they're cheap. They're always worried about the money. It's just the conversation always seems to revolve around how much you're charging. Um, they say things like, oh, well, this only takes 10 minutes. Well, look, I have a $125 trip fee. That includes jobs that only take 10 minutes. That is factored in when I come up with my trip fee because there are gonna be a lot of jobs that don't take only 10 minutes that I'm also charging that 125 for. If they're questioning you every now and then, you know, that's one thing. But if they're basically trying to imply that your easy jobs should be way less than your trip fee, or if they're trying to imply that your big jobs for which you're doing a good job on and for which you're charging a fair but good for you rate, if they think those are too expensive and you're always having to spend your time having conversations with people simply about how much money you're charging, that's no good. That takes up all your time. It's just, it's not a good working relationship. Uh, another way you know they're cheap is they're always asking for itemized estimates. Now, this may be because the property manager's cheap, or it may be because the homeowners of the homes that that property manager manages. It may be that those homeowners are all cheap. It may be that you have a property manager 
who's essentially her target market is people who are trying to save money. Those property managers are offer, offering the cheapest property management rates around and they're gonna do everything for you. And to keep those homeowners happy, what they're doing is they're coming to you wanting itemized estimates or the homeowners themselves are wanting itemized estimates all the time where they want a breakdown of labor for replacing a toilet flapper, materials for replacing the toilet flapper, labor for replacing the faucet, materials for replacing the faucet, they want to see receipts for everything. They want it as itemized as can be. And what you end up getting on those is number one, you get a lot of complaints because they don't like that you're making good money. And number two, you're getting a whole lot of where you take the time out of your day to go do the estimate. You spend a lot of time itemizing the damn estimate. And then once you've done all of that, they want to come back. Oh, there's my alarm. Once you've done all of that, they want to come back. And they want to say, okay, the homeowner is going to take care of items one, five, eight, and 11, and you can take care of the other ones. And of course, one, five, eight, and 11 were the jobs that are relatively easy that we're going to make up for some of the extra labor or some of the unknowns that are going to get in your way and cause you to spend more time later on on the other ones. So itemize, when they ask for itemization, it's always, always, always because somebody wants to know exactly what you're charging for every little thing you do so that they can either complain about it or so that they can say, ah, no, 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 I'm going to do those easy ones and I'll let you take the hard ones. Uh, so I don't do itemized estimates. The only, the closest I come to itemizing is if for my property managers that I really like that send me a lot of work, I will break down how much is materials and how much is labor. Nothing further, not task by task, just total materials and total labor. And that's only for the ones that I actually have some sort of like loyalty to because they keep my business running well. Uh, they ask for hacks. And yeah, that's just a no no for me. This is going to come up later on in another one of my one through fives. But they ask for hacks. And what I mean by they ask for hacks is there is a there's the right way to fix something. And then there's a way to fix that same thing that's going to be cheaper temporarily, but it's going to break again later. And this is going to affect your reputation again later. So don't do hacks. I'm trying to think of a good example, but I mean, like, let's say here's a good example. Actually, I don't replace packings inside faucets. So when a faucet's dripping, a lot of times it's because of a packing inside there where you've got the ball valve. And what happens when they start dripping, it's usually because you've gotten so much calcite built up inside that ball valve from the water that's running here and there and drying on that it becomes like a fine little sandpaper and it rubs those packings down over time. If they ask me to just replace packings on a faucet because they don't want to pay for a new faucet, I don't do that. And the reason I don't do that is because I know that if I put new packings into a sandpaper faucet, three months from now, it's going to be dripping again. And the reason it's going to be dripping again is because the sandpaper is going to rub those new packings right back down. And again, if this is a property manager I've developed some loyalty to because I've been with them a couple of years and they've been really good to me and it's a one-time ask, maybe there's always exceptions to the rules. But if you're vetting, this implies they're new. And if they're new, you need to be on the same page with them right away because you're not going to get to change how you do business later without them being upset is you, you don't do hacks. You know, as a handyman, what the proper fix is. And that's what you should be doing is the proper fix. And if they're asking for hacks, it's because they're trying to save money. And if they're, again, it's just this general idea. If they're always trying to save money, it's just going to be bad for you. You're just going to have this constant hassle of them trying to save money. And the last one on being cheap is they're asking for hourly rates. Now, there are some that are just used to hourly rates and they just want it. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to say stay away from that as well. Don't stay away from them if they ask for an hourly rate, but stay away from them if they demand it. If they ask for it, you can just say, hey, if it's not covered under my trip fee, I will let you know when you can approve or not approve it, but I don't have hourly rates because my rates would be different for electrical, different for plumbing, different for outside work in the middle of the summer when it's 120 degrees, different for work that makes me climb under crawl spaces full of dog shit. My rates are different for all the different things that I do. I have different guys with different skills 
whose labor I might charge different rates for. So I can't just give you an hourly rate. What I can do is I can be fair. I can send you a list of my old uh, invoices, like say from the past 30 days, and you can see what my rates kind of are and you can compare them. We can do a lot of things to work together, but what we can't do is have an hourly rate because the cheap ones, what they're going to do is the homes that have cameras or the homes that have electronic key boxes, they're literally going to be trying to figure out. I had one company that I barely did any work for because they were so annoying. They had a sign-in book at the house. And when you arrived, you had to sign in with the time and what you were there for and you had to sign out. And they were looking at those to find out if the guys who said they were $60 an hour, uh, if they were actually there for three hours. And if they weren't there for three hours, but they charged 180 bucks, then they want a discount. And that doesn't work for me. So that's red flag number one, how you vet your property managers. You have to get on with them to test them out and to vet them. You have to give them a few weeks to a few months before you can figure out the answers to these questions. But if they're cheap, if their main concern seems to be money, they're not the ones. And again, I'm going to repeat this. This assumes you're doing a good job for a good price. If you're, you might just be too expensive, but you should know that. So number two, they don't respect your time. And here's a example is they want free estimates for everything. It's not only that they want the estimate for free, because some of them are just used to that, but they want it for everything. It's going to seem like half the jobs they send you or every job they send you or in some way, shape or form, too many of your jobs, they want estimates. And this, again, is because they're cheap. What a lot of them are doing is they're sending the same job. They're getting just like a leaky faucet and they're sending that to three guys, you and two other guys. And they're looking for which one comes back and says he'll do it for the cheapest. It's essentially like a bidding war to find the cheapest guy for each job. It's a waste of your time just doing the estimate because it's it's going to be free most of the time if it's one of those. They're not going to pay. Nobody's asking you for estimates for every job and wanting to pay you for all those estimates. So if they just want way too many estimates, way, way, way too many estimates, uh, then they don't respect your time. That's a sign that they view you as a lowly handyman, not as a business professional providing, providing a solid service to their business. Um, another one is this, uh, like, just go take a look at it. I don't have many of these. It's never been a big issue for me. It's only been asked by the property managers for whom I respect. And I'll just say, yeah, sure, send me a work order and I'll go take a look at it because they need to know that you need to charge money for your time. But if they want you to like just go take a look or they want you to do estimates for every single damn job they have, they just don't respect your time. And your time is extremely valuable. It's everything around your business is essentially based on billable time. Whether they have it as a rate per hour or not, it's still your time. You're still needing to make X amount of dollars for X amount of hours in your day. So if they don't respect your time, uh, again, you got to get on with them to find out. But if you see that pattern of not respecting your time, you need to be finding more property managers to vet. And you need to keep taking work from these guys, assuming they're not horrible, while you start picking up work from these guys. And when these guys come up this far, these guys come down this far until you've got enough over here that you can just start dropping these. And I've dropped plenty. It's not fun. You don't have to lie to them. You just let them know like, hey, this I don't have enough time to do your work. I've got too many other people who are wanting to pay me too much money for me to be spending my time on this. So number three, unethical property managers. This is one that I, for me, I take personally because for them to ask me to do unethical things, it implies that they view me as an unethical person. And that's not the reputation I'm trying to develop. Uh, first thing unethical property managers will do is they'll ask you for hacks. And I don't mean the same kind of hacks as above where they're trying to save money. I mean, hacks as in they're trying to save a lot of money and they're trying to do it knowingly by knowingly asking you to do something that is unsafe for the home or that is is literally the, not just a less good way to do things, but that's the wrong way to do things. So this might be something like, let's say I find uh, an outlet, and this is a silly example. This hasn't come up. I'm just trying to find examples though. So let's say they find an outlet that keeps tripping the breaker 
and they ask you if you can do anything about it and you let them know you're like hey you know basically what's happening is assume that this is what you found out is that what's happening is this outlet is just not handling the power the breaker itself is not handling the amount of power that's coming through this outlet plus all the other outlets on the stream and then what they'll want you to do is see if you can like just remove an outlet or they want you to see if you can just tighten up the wiring or they want you to somehow hack something so that that string is less likely to be tripping the breaker. This is assuming the breaker is good. This is assuming the wire is sized correctly. And that really what you have is just too many outlets on one breaker. And the correct solution here is if the wiring and everything will allow, and you would need to be a good electrician to know this, a licensed electrician, but if it would allow for a bigger breaker, which if it would, there would probably already be one, then you put a bigger breaker in if it can handle that. If it can't handle that, you need, or you need to remove one of the other outlets, or you need to have a talk with tenants and say, hey guys, you can't run a crock pot and a hair dryer and your TV and your satellite internet dish and these five other things all off of just these outlets that are on this one leg. So it's probably a bad example, but you get the point. It's where they're asking you to do a hack that isn't just like a, a less good way to save a little money, but where they're asking you to do something that's literally unsafe or that you know to be very directly the wrong way to do a job that is going to fail for sure later. Maybe they want you to just like paint over some rotten lumber. That's honestly a much better example. Let's say you've got a rotten post holding up a front porch and you say, hey, this post has to be replaced. There aren't other options. And they say, can you just fill it and paint it because they're selling this house in a month? No, you can't. It's unethical. Uh, they ask you to make it so that they can charge the tenant for things. I have one female, and it seems to only be the females who have ever done this, but I have one female in specific. I, I do this much work for her, but I have to tell her no all the time. And the only reason I do the work for her ever is because she's a member of a bigger company that's basically not my biggest client, but one of my two equally large clients that which probably account for like 70% of my work, maybe 80%. And she is, if there's a garbage disposal that's not working, she wants to know specifically, she will type this out. Please look for anything in the garbage disposal that I can tell the tenant that they have to pay for it. Now, yeah, if a tenant's dumping chicken bones down the garbage disposal and they clog it up, that's kind of their fault. My point is more to the fact that this one is always trying to figure out a way to put it on the tenant. Every single time she's got some idea of how we might be able to put this on the tenant. And I absolutely cannot stand that. And I don't play along with it. I don't do it. I'll just say, yeah, if I can, I will. And then when I get there, I do my job and I bill her and I let the owner pay for it unless it's honestly, legitimately negligence from the tenant. Uh, another one that falls under unethical is related, but it's kind of done in a more organized fashion is when you do a move out, you're typically going to get a list of things that are owner responsibilities. So you're going to have an owner move out and you're going to have a tenant move out. And the tenant move out is going to cover all of the things that the owner would not otherwise have needed to always be covering that are just damages from the tenant. And what they'll do, because they won't be asking you, hey, can you help me put this on the tenant? They'll just put things on the tenant move out that you know aren't the tenant's responsibility. You know, for example, patch and paint uh, on a door jam at the top. Sometimes for, I see it on the tops all the time where because of the way the door is put in there, it rubs the top every time it closes over and over. So you now need to patch that paint. You need to sand it down far enough or sand the door down or shave or whatever so that that doesn't happen again. And then you need to paint that door jam white again. That's not the tenant's responsibility. It's just not that that happened because of the way the door is designed and because of the way the door is installed. But what you'll see is things on the tenant portion that you know are the owner's responsibility. And if that's the case, you just need to tell them, hey, this belongs on the owner portion. And if they ask you, hey, can you just keep it on the tenant portion anyways? Again, 
you do whatever you got to do to run your business. But as far as vetting a property manager, you need to know this is not a good property manager. This is an unethical property manager and an unethical property manager will always be unethical in multiple ways. And if they're not treating tenants fairly, don't you think for a second that they're not going to throw you under the bus whenever it becomes necessary for them to save their ass. Oh, Chuck. Hey, what's up, man? You're always here. Yeah, Chuck. So here's what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to start doing all my videos as live streams. Uh, and I'm not going to call them live streams. It's just rather than turning on the camera, recording the video, and then editing and uploading. There's no editing. I don't edit. I don't even know how anyways. So what I'm doing now is every time I do a video, I'm just going to make it a live stream. And if you all happen to notice and jump in and ask some relevant questions, that's even better. So if you have any, Chuck, you know, go ahead and ask them. I do ask that we keep it on topic. I've mentioned this already before, but for anybody who's just jumping in, I do ask that we keep it on topic. Tonight's topic is how to vet property managers and how they're vetting you. So uh, as long as it's somehow related to that, feel free to ask any questions or make any comments. So yeah, unethical. Uh, it all has to, and even it all goes back to saving money. When they're being unethical, it's because they're not trying to just save money. They're trying to specifically save the homeowner money. Uh, number four, they're entitled. And I can't, this is another personal one for me. I can't stand entitled people in general, but let's go through some examples. Uh, biggest one is they expect priority without having earned it. And what that means is, you know, I've, I don't know how many property managers I have right now, but as far as common, the ones I expect to keep receiving work from on a daily or at least weekly basis, like seven of them or something. And those seven, no, one, two, three out of my seven have earned some amount of loyalty from me, have earned the right to call me and say, hey, I have a big favor to ask. The rest of them haven't. They don't send me enough work. But you'll get these property managers. You'll be with a brand new company. And what they think is that you're a lowly handyman, a lowly, desperate, unskilled handyman who's begging for work. And they think that they can call you and tell you that they need a job done today. And that's fine if it's once. But when it's all the time, when they think their job needs to be the priority job or their list of seven jobs needs to be the priority job, all the time when they want to know why you didn't get to it for three days man i'm booked out here's my calendar for the week right now for next week that i'm working on i'm booked out half the week already for next week and by the time i get there i'm going to be booked out for the entire week so when they send me a new job that isn't a priority it's not a something leaking into a cabinet destroying the cabinet it's not a safety issue it's not a security issue because the front door won't lock there's no priority there. My priority goes to my loyal, long-time property managers who have earned that from me. So that's another, but that's a red flag that you're going to see is when they expect priority service and they just got on with you and they want it for all their jobs. Um, expecting higher quality for the price. And this is more, this is not about pricing. It's higher quality for the price after the fact. So what they do is they'll, uh, here's a great example, actually. I have, I have two female property managers right now who do this. They still do it all the time. I'm not dropping them because they, they don't enforce this to the end. They try to. But here's what happens. Patch and paint. You got to move out. And now you've got a patch and paint. And it's one where when the tenant moved in, the previous patch and paint wasn't done. So the tenant doesn't have to pay for the patch and paint. The homeowner does. So we do the patch and paint and their work order to me, as they type it out, they're very specific. And they say two nail holes in this wall, one scuff on that baseboard. Or they say something to the effect of there's just a few dents and scuffs around the house, but not much. And so you go in and you do what you know to be a reasonable job. You get to know your companies, you get to know your managers, you get to know the level of the homes that these companies and managers tend to have. And you just kind of know going in, you know, I mean, I can go into any home that I just finished and do another inspection and I'll find one or two tack holes that I missed or I'll find a scuff that I missed. You can always, and if I, I can go through and do that, 
and then fix all of those and go through and do another inspection and find one or two more things. There's always more to find if you're looking. So what these guys do, the ones who are entitled and expecting a higher quality for the price after the fact, is they try to imply in the work order that they send you that they're not wanting you to do a lot, that this is a quick, easy one, should be cheap. And then you go and you do your job and you kind of adhere to sort of the feeling that they gave you in terms of what they're looking for. And then after the fact, you get a call or you get a text or you get a message that says, hey, I just went and looked at this home and I noticed you've missed a few nail holes here and you missed that there and you didn't do this thing to that thing. And none of them are things that were specific on the work order. They're just general things where they went. And again, I'm going to say that I keep saying this. This is assuming that you're doing a good job. This is assuming that you are doing a good handyman job and that you were charging good, fair prices and you know that you have and you're finding that it's this one property manager out of the seven. It's this one property manager who comes back to you after the fact and wants you to go back and do a little bit more free work. Now, another trick that they'll have when they do this is they'll ask you, they'll say, replace burnt out bulbs and then they'll say dash living room two bulbs upstairs bathroom three bulbs upstairs master bedroom one bulb so they've specified now if they just say replace burnout bulbs i'll go through the whole house and i'll replace all the burnout bulbs if you're going to specify which burnt out bulbs you want me to replace depending on what kind of property manager you are and what kind of relationship we have I'm not going to go check every single bulb in the entire house. There are some fixtures where you can't tell if one bulb is out without taking the frosted dome down to actually take a look. So they'll ask you to replace specific bulbs, and then they'll go check it out after the fact, and they'll realize they missed a bulb. They didn't ask you to replace a bulb that was out that you didn't notice because they're not paying you to do an inspection. And again, this, this is just an example. If it's a good property manager, I inspect anyways. And if I find one more bulb, I just replace it because those property managers I've vetted and I know that they're going to pay me for that bulb without, without complaining because I know that's what they want me to do. This is for vetting new property managers. So you want to watch out for when they're going back and it's, it's on your, what's the word? You have to use your own judgment of yourself and of the property manager and of the value of the house and of a lot of different things to figure out, are they going back and looking for things to send you back for after the fact for free work, for essentially getting more value out of less money, knowing you're going to do what they asked, charge them a fair amount, and then they're going to squeeze a little more extra out of you by pretending like you didn't do your job well. That's what you want to figure out. That's the red flag you're looking for. <laughs> Number five, they're not good at their job. And let me tell you, some of them just aren't. Now, they might be new, which means they'll get better at their job. And that's actually a benefit to you if they're new and not good at their job, because you can help them get better at their job. You can even save their ass a few times by noticing some things they didn't notice. What I'm talking more about is they're not good at their job in terms of they're lazy, or they've been doing this a long time and they just suck at it. They just, a good example I see all the time, not a big deal for my property managers that I'm loyal to because I know that I can just do the thing that they missed. But here's a great example. I'll get these work orders that say replace door stopper in bedroom number two, second bedroom on the left at the end of the hallway. And I'll go down there and there's no door stopper. So I replace it. Nowhere else on the work order do they say replace door stopper for any other doors. As I'm walking through the house, there's three other doors without door stoppers. This is not an example of the entitled one who's purposefully saying replace one, and then they're going to come back after and tell you that you missed one. That's not what I'm talking about. These are just ones that are not good at their job, and they miss the most obvious stuff. You know, you look under the sink, and it's dripping under the sink, there's a bunch of water damage on the cabinet and you can see the damn leak. They're not good at their job. The reason we wanna stay away from the ones who are not good at their job is because generally speaking, in my experience, if they're not good at their job, they're going to be blaming you for all the things they miss. Because what they do is they go inspect, they create a list of items for you to fix. You fix that list of items, you invoice, you get paid, 
And then later on, somebody's moving in and the somebody moving in is finding five more things that were super obvious that shouldn't have been missed. And then that property manager wants to pretend like you as the handyman should have noticed that and told them. Now, again, 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 for your good property managers that you vetted and that have some loyalty to you and you have some loyalty to them, I inspect those houses. I, I don't do, I don't spend an hour going down a checklist, but everywhere I'm going in that house, I'm just, I'm noticing any other little things that they could have missed because I know I can call them and I know they'll answer. And I know when I say, hey man, you missed five things, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead and knock that out. Thanks for noticing. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the ones who were seriously not good at their job just because they suck at their job. It wasn't a bad day. They weren't in a hurry because they had five properties to inspect. They just suck at their job. And the ones who really do just suck, they don't get better and they blame you for it. And you can't afford to have that happening. So that takes care of vetting that's like my five main areas that i use for vetting actually i'm gonna throw on a bonus uh there's one recently i'm still doing work for every other pro for like five other property managers at her company but there's one that i won't do any work for anymore and i know that she's now because i know which properties are her she's having other property managers send me her work and that's fine because i like the other property managers but here's what she did we had a windowsill that had a little bit of drywall damage on the windowsill. So they said, hey, this is during the rainy season. So they said, hey, we think we've got a leaky window or something. Can you go check it out? So I sent one of my guys, it wasn't me, but one of my guys went. It was very obvious that the leak was coming from around the frame of the window from the outside. There was big old gaps. It all, everything fit just right that that was the issue. So he sealed up that window but I wanted him to check out the roof too. And he had a tall extension ladder. I mean, tall, tall extension ladder. It still wasn't tall enough. It was the first time ever in two years that there was a job that we didn't have between any of us, didn't have a ladder tall enough to get to. And the ones that you could get, that could get to there were like 450 bucks. And yeah, that's not a lot of money all the time. But at that point in time, that was a lot of money. We didn't have the money to buy it right away. So I went and put a note on the job on their, their software that they use. And here's what the note said. We found the source of the leak. We repaired the source of the leak. It's the window. Here's the repair we did. However, I'm not going to invoice this yet because before I invoice this, I want to get on the roof and just make sure. Because what I don't ever, ever, ever want to do is tell you that I've solved the problem and invoice you for having solved the problem and get paid for having solved the problem and then find out the problem wasn't solved, that our job was incomplete. So I said, hey, this is solved. I'm confident that it's solved. It rained yesterday and I verified with the tenant that there's no more leak on the window, but I'm not gonna sign this off an invoice until I can get up on the roof and inspect the roof. So a month and a half goes by I know the job is fixed. I know that we don't have any more leaks and I'm not worried about getting paid for it because I have so much other work going on. There was so much money coming in and so much work. I mean, we were working, everybody was working seven days a week. It was insane because it was the rainy season here in Arizona and your days just get, you've got like months of just nonstop leaks and drywall repairs. So I didn't invoice month and a half goes by finally get the ladder get up there inspect the roof there's nothing to be found on the roof as i knew there wouldn't be but then i go to invoice the job and the job's not there anymore and their software where i need to go to market complete and upload my invoice the job just doesn't exist and long story short basically what she said was that she wasn't going to pay me for that job because after a month and a half went by and it wasn't done she had to reassign it to another vendor now, I don't know what that other vendor told her, what they did or didn't fix, but I know from my communications with the tenants that that window never leaked again. My fix was good. She knew I had fixed it, and she just didn't want to pay me for that job. I will never do work for her again, ever. If she wants to go backwards through her other property managers, that's fine, because what I know about the other property managers there is that they know that she now has to go through them to get to me. They know 
that not paying me for a job that I did, that I did correctly in a reasonable amount of time and communicated properly about, you don't pay me for that kind of job. I'm not doing any more work for you because I can't trust you. I have way too much work coming in and I'm way too busy to be doing work for property managers who don't want to pay me. So well, that's a number six if you want to say that. But it's fairly obvious that if you do a good job in a reasonable amount of time and communicate effectively and for any reason they just decide they're not going to pay you, you're done with them. Don't ever do not ever take any more work from them again. So now we're moving on to how they're vetting you. And most of this is going to be somewhat repetitive because uh, I know I've mentioned a thousand times what you need to do to be successful. Because what you need to do to be successful is keep, look, I've got a green one now, so I'm going to paint you with my green pen. Um, <clears throat> so how they're vetting you. Let's put you in the shoes of a new property manager. Man, can y'all hear me? I've got eight people in here. I mean, that's not a lot. I'm not intending to have a live stream, but I'm hoping my audio is good because I don't see anything at all going on on the comments. So they're vetting you. Uh, let's start at the beginning. If a property manager accepted you as a new handyman, generally speaking, it's because they need you. And the reason they need you, oh, thank, oh, cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you verifying the audio is good. So let's say a property manager is in a position where they need you. If they need you, generally speaking, I'm going to tell you most of the time, like 80, if not 90 percent of the time, it's because they have shitty handyman or a shitty handyman who is either he's doing bad jobs. He's too expensive. He doesn't show up. There's too many complaints from the tenants. The long list of reasons that this other guy, they don't want to be using him or they can't use him, one or the other. So now they're finding a new handyman and chances are you contacted them three months ago and they never sent you any work, but they kept your info on file. They're fed up with this guy. Now they want to use you. So they need to vet you. This is super important, actually. I should make like a whole video on just how to impress your property managers. So here's what should happen, right? They're gonna, maybe they're gonna have a conversation, maybe they're not. The conversation, you just gotta decide based on all of my videos and all your experience, how to handle the conversation. But that first job comes through, and I do this every time, and I'm not ashamed of it. A brand new property manager that I've never received any work from, when they send me that first job, they just became client number one. Now, it's not literally number one. Obviously, I'm not going to drop the ball on anything else. But let's say I've got two to three week, weeks worth of work booked out. Half of those jobs are not priority. They're not super important. They can take as long as they need to take. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to take that new job from that new property manager. The instant it comes in, I'm going to call that tenant. I'm going to schedule the first spot that I can schedule them on, even if that means that I have to bump some other non-priority job. And I'm going to get them in right away. So what's going to happen is I'm going to receive a text or an email or an alert on their software that I've now uploaded on my phone or whatever. I'm going to receive that job instantly. I'm going to call, I'm going to schedule, and then I'm going to reply back to that new property manager. Boom, this job is scheduled for this day at this time right away they're going to be like god damn this is nice look at this this guy's on top of things my old handyman didn't call tenants for two weeks and then i had tenants calling me complaining that they haven't heard from anybody yet so that's the first thing i'm going to do is and this is how they're vetting you so when i'm giving you examples of what you need to be doing what i'm telling you is what they're looking for they're vetting you here's how you pass their vetting process uh let's see chris castro says have you found that PM companies have a slow time of year. Yes, sir. It's right now. Right now. Starting Thanksgiving, ending at the end of January, horribly slow. So I get my new job. <clears throat> I schedule it immediately. I don't just schedule it immediately. I also let the property manager know immediately that I've scheduled it immediately. Now, one of the ways they're going to bet you is they're going to be in communication with and this guys i'm going to tell you is just about every time they're nervous about new handymen the same way that i'm nervous about new because i need new guys now and i'm nervous about them because so many of them suck 
But here's what they're going to do is when you're done with the job, maybe even before you go to the job, they may call to ask the tenant how their interaction with you during scheduling was. They may call the tenant and say, hey, I just found out that this new job is scheduled. Do me a favor and let me know how this handyman is because they're scared. They're scared you're going to show up drunk, high, stinky, wear nasty, dirty clothes, um, late or not show up at all. Any number of they're scared of a thousand different things. So your goal when you get that first job from that property manager, they're vetting you. Your goal is to impress them. So now that you've scheduled and you've let them know you're scheduled, you show up the day of. In fact, you send a confirmation message. And I'm going to get into this in another video. I don't do confirmation messages except for these new jobs. And that's because people will cancel. Your confirmation message the day before reminds them that their house is a fucking mess and they're embarrassed for you to show up. And suddenly they need to go out of town tomorrow. So I don't do confirmation messages the day of or the day before. But for these new jobs, confirmation message the day before, maybe another one the morning of, be extremely polite, be extremely professional with all of your interaction. Show up to that job 15 minutes early, text them and let them know like, hey, I showed up 15 minutes early. I'm happy to wait outside until our scheduled appointment time, or I can come in now. Do the job so quickly and so efficiently that the tenant is impressed. Be as professional as you can. Shake their hands. Look them in the eyes. Do all of the things that you need to do to make them think you're the best damn handyman they've ever seen. And then, so we're done with that part. Your property manager is going to talk to them and going to find out that they were so impressed with you. This guy was dressed well. He was groomed. He didn't stink. He wasn't high. He did all. Of, he checked every box that you would want to check. Now you need to invoice this job. When you invoice this job, I'm not telling you to, to bill too little. You don't want to bill too little because you don't want to get them in the habit of feeling like you're a very affordable handyman. But bill Let's say you have a window, right, that you want to be in. Below that window, you're not charging enough. Above that window, you're screwing people over and charging too much. Within your window, get it below the halfway mark of that window. So your window starts here and ends here. My nose is the middle. So don't charge up here. Charge in here. Now, three, four, five, six jobs in, start charging in here every now and then up here and back in here and up here and back in here and up here. You can come up over time, but in the beginning, you want that property manager to feel that they've just found the best handyman in the world. And then yes, later on, you're not gonna do the same thing. Later on, you're not going to call immediately and schedule a job the instant you receive that new job. You're not gonna respond immediately. What you're gonna do is you're gonna do it daily, which is what you should be doing. It should be within 24 hours. 48 hours is kind of acceptable for calling tenants and getting them scheduled or at least letting them know that you have the job. Maybe you say, hey, I'm going to be doing all my scheduling on Saturday, but I'm calling you today, Thursday, just to let you know I have the job. I'm on the ball. We're really busy, but I'm going to get you scheduled. That should happen within 24 hours, 48 at the most, and I don't recommend 48. But yeah, I'm not going to do this immediate everything. I'm not going to bend over backwards on every job always for this property manager. But if you can convince them in the beginning that you're a good handyman and get them sending you more jobs, once they're comfortable sending you jobs and you're not screwing these jobs up and you're not getting complaints called in by the tenants and stuff, you just became their new handyman. Now, here's another thing you need to know is, so this is what I do right when you can't do a job right, or when you for a week and you can't work for a week and they need to send some work to somebody else, don't forget as time goes on and you settle in to this new property manager, you need to always be giving them a great service. If not the service that I'm talking about giving for a new property manager right off the bat to get them hooked. If you stop giving them that great service, there's going to come a day they send one job to me and I'm going to recognize that problem, and I'm going to kick ass on it. They're going to start sending me your work. So don't ever get lazy. Don't misunderstand when I say I don't treat them this way always, that it's only in the beginning. This is like a honeymoon phase. When you go on a first date with somebody, you look and smell and behave way better 
than you normally do in real life. Maybe some of you are going to say, oh, no, I don't. But the truth is you do. None of us are giving 150% to everything we do all the time. But you need to impress in the beginning. And then you need to be a 10 out of 10 in the beginning. And you need to remain an 8 out of 10 forever. And when you can be a 9 or a 10, be a 9 or a 10. And if you have to be a 7 sometimes, be a 7 sometimes. But give them that 8 out of 10 always. We've got some comments. Would this be a good time to try and meet PMs? Boy, I tell you what, Chuck, I hadn't thought of that, and you're right. I don't happen to need any new ones at the moment, but yeah, if you're in a position where you're hoping to grow your business and you're too busy most of the year, honestly, that's a good idea. I would definitely say plan for early January, like after New Year's, the first week or two of January. If you want to make an effort to get dressed up, have all your packets completed, have all your paperwork ready for them, have 1099s and all that ready for them, and you want to go bring on some new companies and you want to impress them in person, go into their offices time after Thanksgiving and before the end of January. Like Christmas Day, January, it's not dead if you have like but it's slow enough that that's when you can really afford charge beard and not for oh yeah charge beard not forehead yeah cool um so they're vetting you you've done that first job or the first five jobs and you pass that test they they've said okay this guy is not an alcoholic who doesn't show up for jobs and whom tenants are generally they like now you're settling in with them and you're starting to get more jobs and you're going on the long term and you're giving that giving them that eight out of ten instead of the ten out of ten. Here's what that eight out of ten entails. And guys, this is so simple. I said it a million times, you need to save them time, which means they need to not be getting contacted by angry tenants. So don't have angry tenants. And the way you do that is by just being a good business owner, showing up on time, getting the job done. But here's another thing they're looking for. And this, this takes longer for them to discover if they're going to discover it. It takes a long amount of time to see if there's a pattern. You don't want callbacks, okay? Every job you need to do, and this goes back to where I'm vetting them, where I'm talking about how I don't do hacks. You know, if they ask for them, I don't do hacks. Don't do hacks also because they're vetting you based on how many callbacks you get. When they're looking at this long term, and you know, your prices have started coming up a little because you're done impressing them in the beginning and you're settling into your like fair, normal business day-to-day -day sort of zone. You can charge what I'm telling you to charge and you can do business the way I'm telling you to do business if, if your work is solid. We've already talked about the pricing. Yes, your pricing, if that's a dynamic. Your work needs to be solid, man. And what that means is if they sent you to repair some closet doors that keep falling off the tracks. They don't know if you, one, need to replace the track, two, need to replace the rollers, or three, need to just adjust things, or four, maybe the track is pretty good. There's so many gradients. You can have a shit track that needs to be replaced for sure. It's never gonna work again. You can have a track that should be replaced. You don't have to, but you really should. And depending on, again, the, the how expensive the house is, how expensive the neighborhood is, what kind of company you're working with, what kind of property manager, your own skills that you can look at. Maybe you try to repair it and just put some new rollers on. There's a whole gradient, right? If you don't pick the right spot on that gradient, if you pick a spot that's too high, you're going to be known for trying to do excess work that isn't necessary and charging too much. They'll stop using you. If you pick a spot on that gradient that's too low and you think, oh, I'm in a hurry, Look, I can bend this track back real quick and just stick an extra screw in that roller. And eh, it's a little iffy, but it works. Charge my 125 bucks. Get out of here. I had a guy who did that kind of work, and he's not one of my guys anymore because I'm vetting him the same way the property manager is vetting me. And the way that is, is if your work comes back, if you said, I solved your problem with this closet door, and then three months later, that closet door needs to be fixed again. It doesn't matter what reasons you have. It doesn't matter what excuses you have. It doesn't matter that it did work when you left. If three months later, it doesn't work again, they're going to notice. If six months later, it doesn't work again, they're going to notice. If it's expensive 
and a year later, it doesn't work again, they're gonna notice. If you replace the wheels on a sliding screen door for a patio door, and three months later, it has fallen off the tracks again, they're gonna notice. And these will start building up. They generally aren't gonna see these in the first three months, unless you're really bad at your job. But if you're really bad at your job, you're gonna find out quickly and you're gonna fail and you'll just be done. But if you're not really bad at your job, then your skill with knowing how they're vetting you is going to be to understand your work has got to be solid. If it's not solid, it's going to come back in three months or six months or a year or some amount of time by which they'll notice. And when they start adding up, they're going to stop using you. One of the guys that I don't use anymore, that's the only reason I don't use, use him. He was the hardest worker in the world. Like he worked as hard as me. And I met very few guys who work as hard as me, but the truth is I just keep getting called back to his jobs. And I called him a few times in person to my house to talk about it, where I was very nice and said, Hey, I'm assuming this is because I did not communicate effectively to you what level of quality I'm looking for. But when this happens enough times over and over, I'm going to stop telling you, and I'm just going to stop sending you work. And that's exactly what your property manager is going to do. She's not going to give you 15 opportunities to make it right. What she's going to do is she's just going to start using another handyman. And if he doesn't fuck up as much as you're fucking up, you're going to see less work while he sees more until you're just off the list. That's how they're vetting you. <clears throat> now, another one that they're looking at in terms of vetting is going to be communication good communication with the tenants, which kind of falls under what I've already covered, but also good communication with them and their homeowners when you can communicate with their homeowners. You need to be very clear. You need to know the terminology of your materials and of the tools and of the parts and pieces and makeups of houses and properties, and you need to communicate very effectively. You cannot be wrong about the words you're saying. Like, for example, they send you a job that says leaky sink. They don't have to communicate well with you. They're, they're going to suck at it because they're not a handyman. Leaky sink could mean dripping faucet. It could mean it's leaking from the handle, which is not a sink. It could mean it's leaking from the actual sink, which is the sink. Or it could mean it's leaking from the drain pipes, which are not a sink. Or the shutoff valve, which is not a sink. However, when you communicate with them, you do have to be accurate. You need to be very precise in your wording. You need to be very precise if you're giving an estimate about exactly what it is you're saying you're going to do. If they send you a, a request for an estimate to paint, to repair and paint the fascia, which I do so much of, it's insane. When you send them the estimate, you need to be clear. You can't just say, oh yeah, I can paint that fascia for $800. You need to be clear that you're going to paint, that you're going to repair, if there's any repairs, five linear feet of two by eight fascia on the west side of the house where it has rotted for blah, 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 whatever reason, and is not repairable. Or is not like you have to replace it because it's not repairable. Or you have to repair it because you can't just scrape and paint. You need to say how many linear feet all around the house is just going to be scrape and paint. And how many linear feet may be just paint because it's not scraped. Like you need to be precise. You need to communicate effectively because if anybody's unhappy, like if a homeowner goes to take a look at the house after you've done the fascia and he's not happy with what he sees, you don't need to prove to him that you did an amazing job because you're not trying to do an amazing job. You're trying to do the job that you were asked to do at the quality level that you said you would do it for the price you said you would do it. If you can pull that quote up and show him and say, look, I said I was going to do these things and I did these things to a perfectly acceptable level. So you got to be super good with your communication because if you're not, and sometimes it annoys them that you're good at it because they think something other than what you said. They assume something other than what you said, or they assume that other work is also included like, oh, if you're painting the fascia, we assumed you would be painting the eaves too. Well, no, eaves aren't fascia. Fascia is fascia, the eaves are the eaves. Those are two different things. Be very precise, be accurate with your communication. Uh, also with communication, and this is like one of my big rules that I know I've mentioned on other videos, always answer your damn phone, always. If a property manager calls, 
if you're going to need to say no, because you know it's like an emergency call, it's eight o'clock at night and your phone's ringing and it's property manager, they need you to go somewhere. Don't just let it ring. Answer your phone and politely tell them that you can't if you can't. And charge damn good money if you can. But don't just not answer your phone. You have no idea how much loyalty you will build up if you just answer the phone and be as nice as you can and say, I'm so sorry, but I promised my family I would be here to, for this event. I work seven days a week and everybody's expecting me. It's not something I can cancel. And then you say, however, if you can't find anybody else, like in 30 minutes, if you call everybody and just everyone is a hard no, I will do it. But I really would like to spend this time with my family. Answer your phone always. Okay, let's go to some comments. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> go so Mossy Cup said go a little above and beyond on your initial visit. Fix a loose cabinet door, seat metal transition nails that are always popping, any little things that go unnoticed that are obvious improvements. That's a yes and a no. Mostly a yes. Um you're you're right. Yeah, if you find something you can like just snap fix in 30 seconds for them, and you can write that on your invoice and you can say free of charge. I also just knocked out a few things. Now, don't do this a lot because they're going to start thinking of you as the guy who's going to do all the little extras for free. When you can go above and beyond and you can do something that was going to need to get done eventually and you do it for free, they do love that. That's a very good idea. One year sober next month so they don't have to worry about... Oh, congratulations, man. That is awesome, Chuck. That's fucking amazing. That makes me really happy to hear I don't drink, um, not for any particular reason. Let me rephrase. I drink, like, I have a couple beers with my father-in-law. I have a margarita if I'm on a beach. Uh, I have a white Russian if I'm hanging out with one of my friends who likes white Russians. Um, but it's not a thing for me. I don't get what most people get out of it. However, cigarettes are like the bane of my existence. I've quit so many times, and, and hopefully I'm quit forever. But, I mean, it's it's hard, bro, so congratulations. Oh, yeah, there's just Jacob. Yeah, you can go back and watch it. Jacob and everybody, I'm going to be doing all of these videos as live streams now, not with the intention of everyone showing up, but so that I can interact a little. I just don't like talking to a camera, so I'm going to plan my videos the way I always do. But then when I do them, there's going to happen to be a couple of y'all here that I like talking to. YouTube handyman, lol, you still got an open Christmas. Oh, yeah, where's, yeah, those ones over there. Those are presents my mom sent for a friend of ours kid, and we just haven't seen her yet, but she's going to get them soon, actually. She used to live with us. We're going to be taking all her stuff to her pretty soon, some stuff she was storing here. Uh, Chris Castro said, requires some personal evaluation. Not sure what you mean, but I think I agree if what you are also meaning to say is something like it requires a lot of judgment. Uh, you do have to use your own judgment on everything over and over. Chris Castro, how do how do handle PMs that want you to patch something that really needs some more work than they want to do, i.e. paint over a serious mold issue? Yeah, that's uh, exactly what I was talking about as far as being unethical that's the, that's where the unethical comes in is it is not ethical for me to paint over mold i need to, there are other ways that you can get rid of it you actually don't need mold remediation companies like a lot of people think but there are proper ways to deal with mold and improper ways to deal with mold the example i gave was when you have a beam holding up a porch and it's starting to rot and they want you to just like fill and paint to hide it don't do that stuff. You, you've, you've vetted that property manager as being one you don't want to work with because if they're willing to do stuff like that to other people and on other people's properties, they're also willing to throw you under the bus the first time that it becomes convenient for them. YouTube handyman, I simply guarantee my work and fix stuff free of charge if it's my fault. Property managers are cheap and not just want to pay by the, and most just want to pay by the hour. You are very correct. I guarantee my work. In fact, when they ask me what my warranty is, sometimes when they're vetting me, they want to know what the warranty is. 
And here's my answer every time. If a job that I've done is not done correctly, if it's because of work that I did that I didn't do correctly, I will fix it for free. And there is no limit. There's not like a one year warranty, six year warranty, 10 year warranty. If it's because of me not doing my job right, I'm going to fix it for free. If it's not because of me not doing my job right, and and it's not because I didn't notice something. Like, for example, maybe I didn't notice the secondary cause of why this thing is going bad. But if I did everything that I should have done, I'm going to go back and fix it for free every time, no questions asked. And if it's not my fault by any means that you can think of, then I'm going to charge you money to fix it again. And it's that simple. <clears throat> YouTube handyman, Chris... <clears throat> You simply put in writing, patch was painted as requested by PM and put in your notes that you recommended full tear down. That way are you you're covered? <clears throat> oh, I see. Okay, yeah, we kind of covered that too. I kind of agree, but no, I'm, I'm not going to paint over mold just because they requested it just like I'm not gonna patch a rotten beam and make it look like it's not rotten just because they requested it. Now, if there's a job where, uh, oh, here's a good one, painting kitchen cabinets. Uh, I don't paint kitchen cabinets because I replace kitchen cabinets. And honestly, the, the work, the labor involved in doing a good job painting kitchen cabinets, the labor involved to do a good job of doing that is more or very close to what I can charge to just put in all new cabinets. It's very labor intensive to do it correctly. Now let's say somebody, and again, this would have to be a loyal property manager that I have some loyalty towards as well. If they said, hey, can you paint these? I'm gonna say, hey, you really don't want me to paint these. You want me to replace these, or you wanna just go with some other company who paints kitchen cabinets, but I can tell you what's gonna happen and I don't care what you do to prevent it, unless you're a world renowned expert and unless you put in the amount of labor that I could have just put in replacing cabinets, unless you do that, oil and grease stains are eventually going to start coming back through these things. And you just, you can't remove all of the oil and grease from old cabinets that need to be painted and prime them multiple layers of primer, of more expensive primer, by the way. So the short answer is, yeah, for that, I would say I did as you requested per your request. I did precisely this. However, I recommended this. I mean, it's okay to do that. I, I just typically don't. Like I said, that would be something I would do as a favor to a very loyal property manager. So the, I agree and disagree. Okay, so that seems to have covered any relevant questions and comments. I hope this was useful to y'all. I've still got hours of shit to do tonight. So I hope you all have a great night. Uh, email me your questions if you want to slash need to comment anything. I reply to all the comments, even if I do take a long time to get to them. Thank you all for subscribing. Thank you for being here. I wish you all very good luck in your journey and you'll have a good